So I'd had a series of, of threatening phone calls without a um, caller's number withheld. And they were threatening to come to my house. And then on a, I happened to miss a call and noticed there was a message. When I played it, I realised the person had made a mistake because he'd left his number effectively because he'd left a message. And this was the, the call. I was very, very shaky. I mean, it was such kind of absolutely uncontrollable rage and fury. I mean, the idea that Jews should be talking to other Jews in this vile way. I mean, I, it was like many other things I've had, but obviously so much, so much worse, so much more overt and crazed, really. Al Jazeera has obtained the largest leak of documents in British political history. Oh my God, this is unbelievable. It is absolutely shocking. Hundreds of thousands of internal communications expose how operatives secretly take control of Britain's Labour Party. The Labour Party is a criminal conspiracy against its members. Free speech was shut down. They tell the inside story of how Sir Keir Starmer, who could be Britain's next prime minister, leads a lawless party. I've waited 17 months to appear in front of you in this hall as leader of our great party. Confidential documents expose tactics to discredit and expel rivals in the party. People are actually quite dangerous who are in with the Labour Party. They were playing with people's lives here. They reveal how Starmer's predecessor was undermined by a smear campaign from within. It disabled him as a politician and as a potential prime minister. Really nice to see you here. Goodbye. How British democracy, known as the mother of parliaments, is being undermined by spying and dirty tricks. No one would expect that a political party would associate themselves with the whole-scale hacking of the press. It's looked like somebody is constantly monitoring me, where I'm going and where my car is parked and where my children is going. It just stinks to high heaven what they're doing in the background. We speak to people whose voices have been silenced, including those who support Palestinian rights. It's very painful. As Palestinians, there was no room for us to enter this debate, and that's how it was designed to be. And the files reveal how a hierarchy of racism exists under Starmer's leadership. I face more racism in the Labour Party than I have in the rest of my life combined. Shame on you! Shame on you! In episode two, the true story behind the Labour Party's anti-Semitism crisis. Shame on you! I feel so ashamed right now that it's come to this. I'm Jewish! And people like you speaking for me! We reveal how truth was subverted. Oh, Jeremy's a racist! and reality turned on its head. That's an absolute lie. I didn't say that. The media was not interested in the reality of the story. Shut your mouth! Mr. Corbett, who are you? I'm, I'm from Sky News. From Sky News. Well, goodbye. Uh, Mr. Corbett, what are you going to do about the perceived anti-Semitism in your party. Mr. Corbyn, have you got any comment? Jeremy Corbyn devoted his political career to fighting racism. And suddenly he becomes Labour leader and uh, the media combines to tell the world that this man is not an anti-racist, he is actually a racist. Mr. Corbyn, what's your response? It disabled him as a politician and as a potential prime minister. Instead of being able to set out his social democratic vision of social justice, he was obliged to fend off one allegation after another that he was actually a noxious racist or at any rate enabled noxious racists.
We stand absolutely against anti-Semitism in any form. We will not tolerate anti-Semitism in any form whatsoever in the party. Let me be absolutely clear. Anti-Semitism is an evil. We in the Labour movement will never be complacent about anti-Semitism. We all need to do better. And under a Labour government, it will not be tolerated in any form whatsoever. I regard the fight against anti-Semitism as an absolute priority. People who hold anti-Semitic views have no place in the Labour Party. This party, this movement, will always be implacable campaigners against anti-Semitism and racism in all its forms. We are your allies. This morning, the Equality and Human Rights Commission published their final report into anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. I found this report hard to read, and it is a day of shame for the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party was condemned for anti-Semitism. The Labour files reveal they were the victims of distortions and misrepresentation. The files contain the entire contents of the party's disciplinary folders since before Jeremy Corbyn became leader in 2015. We have really detailed data and information that one doesn't normally see about a political party. The I-Unit investigation draws, too, on voices that have been sidelined. Jews who supported Corbyn, but don't support Israel and British Palestinians. It was painful as Palestinians. It's very hard for you to enter the debates, and that's how it was designed, designed to be. In 2016, Labour Party member Helen Marks is interviewed by party officials as part of an investigation into her local constituency Labour Party. We'd been accused of anti-Semitism by a member of the CLP who was also a councillor. I felt it was a totally outrageous um, accusation. What he was doing was equating criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. My father lost all his family during the Holocaust. His parents were rounded up and killed in the, either in the Warsaw Ghetto or taken off to a concentration camp. Rika Bird attends the interview as a witness, what's called a silent friend. Both women are Jewish. Three years later, Panorama, the BBC's longest-running current affairs programme, broadcast a damning film. Do you think Mr Corbyn is anti-Semitic? I've been asked that a number of times. Mm. And you can tell from my polls that it's still a question I struggle with. Labour's internal communications reveal the anger of party officials at what they regard as a betrayal of the BBC's duty of impartiality. The BBC has used its market monopoly and might as a public broadcaster to run a biased political agenda. It's not a programme about anti-Semitism. It's a hit piece. A description of Marks and Bird's disciplinary interview features in the documentary. The interview is conducted by Ben Westerman, a party official who is Jewish. Ben Westerman received dozens of complaints. While interviewing one member, he was confronted with the very anti-Semitism he'd been investigating. And we finished the interview. The person got up to leave the room and then turned back to me and said, where are you from? And I said, what do you mean, where am I from? And she said, I asked you, where are you from? And I said, I'm not prepared to discuss this. And they said, are you from Israel? What can you say to that? You are assumed to be in cahoots with, with the Israeli government. It's this obsession with that that, that just spills over all, all the time into anti-Semitism. Rika Bird speaks to Westerman at the end of the interview. When he says, um, where are you from? Are you from Israel? That's an absolute lie. I didn't say that. 
With Westerman's permission, the two women record the interview. The, the, the full recording shows what actually did happen. Curious, because I haven't been in the Labour Party very long, and I've certainly never been to anything like this informal interview before. Um, and it, so I'm just curious about, um, like, what branch are you in? I don't think that's relevant. Oh, OK. I hope that's OK. I'm sorry, I, just don't, I don't think where I'm from is, is at all relevant to, to the investigation. I did ask Westerman, what branch are you from? Um, meaning what branch of the Labour Party, because it was a Labour Party internal investigation. The word Israel never came into the exchange between me and Westerman. At the time, I, I could hardly believe it, but I actually feel very angry about it now, because I feel it's so trivialising what is a really important issue. A veteran anti-racist campaigner analyzes Labour's confidential disciplinary files. My mother was a Holocaust survivor who lost dozens of her own family, um, primarily in Auschwitz and Theresienstadt. I am a former ANC member of parliament from South Africa, where I served under Nelson Mandela. And I have written and lectured, including at Auschwitz, on genocide prevention. Hundreds of party activists are suspended and expelled on the basis of evidence in these files. It consists largely of social media posts. There are examples of genuine, clear anti-Semitism. You know, here is an, an example that says, the enemy is not Muslims or Christians or Judaism. The real enemy is Rothschild Zionism. The Rothschild family holds about 80% of the world's total wealth, Rothschild dynasty. This is a fairly standard anti-Semitic trope. An image from social media with the word obey in large letters and how Jews control the American media. Here is another one. Who killed JFK? Who killed Lincoln? Who attacked the USS Liberty? Who is attacking our liberty? I'll tell you who Jews. We can see real anti-Semitism. But then there is also a lot of information in these disciplinary files where there is clearly no anti-Semitism whatsoever. There's one post that reads, in memory of four little footballers rest in peace. And I'm sure many people will recall um, these four young kids, nine to 11 years old, playing football on the beach, who were shot dead by Israeli forces. Another example, we demand that International Criminal Court and the UN charge Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel for war crimes against humanity. Very similar put Israel on trial for war crimes. To suggest that this is somehow anti-Semitic is simply trying to avoid Israel being called out for its appalling abuses in the occupied territories. Files reveal a number of party members are investigated for sharing links to a 2017 I-Unit investigation. The lobby establishes ties between the Israeli embassy in London and organizations within the Labour Party. An officer for the parliamentary group Labour Friends of Israel is covertly filmed. This was film. This is evidence. Now this is sufficient reason to be investigated because you refer to this film by Al Jazeera that has been seen all over the world that was actually critically acclaimed in many places. This is an attempt to close down 
any sort of meaningful political discussion or political debate on these matters. As well as Labour Friends of Israel, the lobby also exposes links between the Israeli embassy and the grassroots Jewish Labour movement. Both organisations are critics of Corbyn. Many of those investigated by the Labour Party believe that Israel is an apartheid state. Israel was created in 1948 by forming a Jewish homeland within historic Palestine, the culmination of the Zionist dream. In 1967, Israel invaded and occupied the remaining Palestinian land. Israel has since isolated Gaza while building illegal settlements in the West Bank, slowly diminishing the size of a potential Palestinian state. Palestinians effectively live under Israeli military control and do not have equal rights. It's not anti-Semitic to uh, call Israel an apartheid state. It's simply a fact. We, we have the Amnesty International report, the Human Rights Watch report. We have Israel's own, one, you know, its major human rights organizations. But Selim have also come to this conclusion. Israel launches an assault on the Gaza Strip following the murder of three Israeli teenagers. What we saw was Israel bombard the Gaza Strip, bombard one of the most densely populated areas on Earth. And in the space of 50 days, they killed over 2,200 Palestinians, including 500 children. And I remember, you know, with my, my brothers, and, you know, they try and act quite tough, but, you know, they would call me crying on the phone. <laughs> It was the most horrific assault on Gaza. The place was devastated. <laughs> it was a bomb to smithereens. It was a, a deeply uh, shocking event in a history of repeated uh, shocking events. Jeremy Corbyn is elected leader of the Labour Party on a radical ticket that challenges Britain's establishment. Jeremy! When Jeremy Corbyn uh, became leader, we were so overjoyed. The continuing occupation, the expansion of illegal settlements, and the imprisonment of Palestinian children are an outrage. At last, we have a Western politician who actually sympathizes with the Palestinians. And in order to help make that two-state settlement a reality, we will recognize a Palestinian state as soon as we take office. Anger over events in Gaza means that many of Corbyn's supporters end up in Labour's disciplinary files. Rot in hell, you Zionist bastards, and those who support them. I boycott Israel because it is a criminal, land-thieving, abusive, murderous, occupying, human rights-denying apartheid state. You can't cover your crimes with claims of anti-Semitism. And I personally, when I came across this, must admit that I find it difficult because it is a brutal image a liberation struggle by its very nature, by its definition, is going to involve huge frustrations, huge anger, extraordinary suffering. You know, I saw the same thing in South Africa. In 1976, when hundreds of innocent, unarmed school children were shot dead by the apartheid military, of course there was outrage, anger, and high emotions around the world 
And so there should have been. This is no different. It's somehow implicitly understood that there are things you can't say. So one of them is you can't talk about your experiences in harrowing terms. You have to keep it sort of cool. Um, and you can't t talk about Israel in the way that it should be talked about. When I started hearing and getting more active about anti-Semitism, I was just confused because you don't, Palestinians never chose who their occupier was. They didn't choose who forced them out of their homes. They didn't choose which religion they were going to say they acted in the name of. There was no choice in that. Time to apologize, Mr. Livingston. Time to Accusations of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party emerge after former London mayor Ken Livingston is attacked for claiming that Hitler had been a supporter of Zionism. You're a lying racist. Really? Why don't you go and check your history? A Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. You dare say, you dare history. say that history. Hitler supported Zionism. You're up, you've, you've lost it, mate. You need help. You need help. You need help. The party announces an inquiry into anti-Semitism and other forms of racism. The launch is overshadowed when a pro-Corbyn activist asks a question. Mark Wadsworth wrote a press release that had been criticised by a journalist from the right-leaning Daily Telegraph. He saw the journalist give it to a Labour MP. Uh, I saw that the Telegraph handed a copy of a press release to um, Ruth Smith MP, so you can see who's working hand in hand. I'm pleased that... I'm pleased... That... She stormed out. She put out a statement uh, claiming that this activist had been uh, a guilty of a classic uh, anti-Jewish trope that Jewish people controlled the media. It's stomach churning. Didn't know she was Jewish. I had no reason to know she was Jewish. I sent through my solicitors, Ruth Smith, a letter saying that uh, what she'd said about me, I could clearly be identified as libelous and that she should withdraw it, she took the statement down. I don't think anybody reported the fact that she took the statement down. It's appalling. The very existence of my party, the Labour Party, is at stake. Every racist, anti seamount out of the Labour Party, it's time for Jeremy Corbyn to act. Criticism of the Labour Party mounts. But not all British Jews oppose the Labour leader. The row over anti-Semitism exposes divisions within the Jewish community. Lots of Jewish people were among the enthusiasts for Jeremy Corbyn. But when the attacks started to really ratchet up against Jeremy and his supporters who were being absolutely demonised and vilified in the media, we talked to others in the party and decided that there was a need for a group which expressed an alternative Jewish view. Pro-Corbyn Jews formed Jewish Voice for Labour. JVL is critical of Israel and Zionism. Unlike its larger rivals, the Jewish Labour Movement and Labour Friends of Israel, both of which are supportive of Israel. For the first time ever, the Labour Party has walked into the disagreement between Jews over Zionists and said one sort of Jews are not only wrong, but they're guilty of anti-Semitism. It's a phenomenon. My understanding of anti-Semitism has always been that it is a prejudice or, or hatred of Jews as Jews, simply because they are Jews or believed to be Jews. Unfortunately, there has developed the new, what is called the new anti-Semitism. That, that to criticize Israel is inherently anti-Semitic. What's being claimed by people, by, by many Jews, is that Israel is part of their identity. But, but more than that, it's part of their Jewish identity. It is essentially 
um, turning criticism of Israel and Zionism into anti-Semitism. The idea that Jew equals Zionist and that anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism is, is dangerous, it's reprehensible, it's an abomination to me. Jewish Voice for Labour is supported by Palestinians in the party who believe they are the victims of racism. Anybody who knows anything about the history knows very well that Israel was created on the basis of a state whose population would be of one community and not others. This is exemplified in my own story. I mean, why should I and my family have left our homes? We felt we had to leave because there had been a dreadful massacre in a village called Deir Yassin, Palestinian village, in which Jewish uh, militias assaulted the village and shot dead over a hundred people. After that terrible massacre, a big jeep went round the streets of Jerusalem with the militias, with these Jewish militias in it, uh, leaders, uh, shouting out, uh, your turn is next. And I have never been allowed to return. No member of my family has returned. No Palestinian I know has been allowed to return for the same racist reason. They are of the wrong race. So you keep them out. Well, if that isn't racism, I don't know what is. Two of Corbyn's opponents confront pro-Palestinian protesters. Most anti-Semitism campaigners belong to the political mainstream, but some are more militant. So what we have here are militant Zionists, the people who campaign for the State of Israel. Paul Scott is a pro-Palestinian activist. You get to know all the faces. It's actually only a very small core of people. They are always there. In many cases, the people they perceive to be anti-Semites are merely people who criticize the state of Israel. Jonathan Hoffman is a former vice chair of the Zionist Federation. He will play an important role in the campaign against Corbyn. With him is Damon Lenzner, another pro-Israel activist. Following this incident, both men are convicted of aggressive bullying behavior. The aim is to provoke, to heckle, and in Jonathan Hoffman's case, it's usually to disrupt. ISM, PSC, want to kill Jews like me. The I unit has discovered links between Hoffman and a far right organization. Members of the Racist English Defense League, or EDL, attended a demonstration that Hoffman helped organize. He is photographed alongside Roberta Moore, the founder of the EDL's Jewish division. She will later express her admiration for Anders Breivik, the neo-Nazi who murdered 77 people in Norway. From around June 2010, the English Defense League started coming to the demonstrations supporting the pro-Israel counter-demonstrators. So they were dressed in, in camouflage gear, they often had balaclavas, dogs with them, St. George's flags, you know, the whole thing. Hoffman is not the only pro-Israel activist who had links to the far right. He worked closely with blogger Richard Millett. Millett's blog regularly provided a platform for Roberta Moore and other EDL supporters. 
There are lots of examples of outright r racism in Roberta Moore's comments on Richard Millet's blog. For example, she refers to burqa-clad dragons and filthy bearded vermin. Arabs have been eating camel for years. The cult of Islam has the power to turn normal human beings into beasts. Hoffman and Millet distanced themselves from the EDL in 2011. Others in their circle of pro-Israel activists do not. There's food on the table, it's very casual, and um, we're all going to participate. So we'll start here on my left. Sharon Claff is co-founder of Campaign for Truth, an organization that claims to promote greater understanding of Israel. Claff regularly expresses support for the English Defence League. She wrote on Millet's blog. They are salt of the earth people fighting for a democratically free England. We all share the greater enemy that is Islam. She's hosting a gathering for people concerned about a Muslim Labour politician, Sadiq Khan, who is soon to become the mayor of London. And some of us were a little bit horrified about some of his alleged connections. Richard Millet is there. Another guest is Dan Fox, a former director of Labour Friends of Israel, which includes a third of Labour MPs. <laughs> so my name's Dan. Um, I'm, an, I'm an old friend of Sharon's um, and a long-standing long uh, Labour Party member and activist. I, I think Sharon has got me here tonight. Um, I'm very happy to, 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 to have been invited. Um, and I will hopefully be um, putting uh, the case uh, counterintuitively for why Sadiq is actually the right choice for the Jews of London. What? So I'm gobsmacked. This, this is somebody who is on, on easy terms, refers to Sharon Claff as an old friend. He's there to persuade them that Sadiq Khan is the good Muslim, that he can be trusted. Dan Fox shouldn't be involved in that kind of gathering. I didn't come from South Africa to be governed by Sharia law. If I want to be governed by Sharia law, I will go and live in Saudi Arabia. Whether you like it or not, Doesn't whether you think it's racist or not, I would be very, very worried with a Muslim in charge. We know not all Muslims are terrorists, of course they're not. But most of the terrorists are Muslim. I don't know who is and who isn't. I'd rather err on the side of safety. I don't trust any of them. Dan Fox is the partner of prominent Labour MP Stella Creasy. Creasy is among demonstrators who gather outside the Houses of Parliament. I feel almost like I'm going to cry. I feel so ashamed right now that it's come to this. The majority of Corbyn's critics do not embrace far-right politics. But they blame Corbyn for allowing anti-Semitism to flourish. Say now in unison, so that he can hear you over there. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. But Corbyn has a problem, one that is ignored in the media coverage. As leader of the opposition, Corbyn has his own office, often known as Lotto. It's the party's general secretary, Ian McNichol, who is in charge of party headquarters. And it's the disputes unit at party headquarters that handles anti-Semitism complaints. Corbyn inherited the party bureaucracy from previous, less radical party leaders. For the first two and a half years of his leadership, Jeremy Corbyn was obliged to work with a general secretary who was hostile to him and, and ran a party machinery which was hostile to him. I've never worked in a, uh, an environment that was so sort of toxic and, and uh, you know, toxic and unfriendly. I remember, for example, the first time I went and walked around uh, HQ and we were just walking around one of the floors and it just goes deathly silent. The Labour files contain a WhatsApp conversation between three senior officials. Claire Francis Fuller, the head of internal governance. Tracy Allen, manager of the General Secretary's office. And Mike Crichton, the director of audit, risk and property. The messages refer to Jeremy Corbyn. I am just about to stab him. 
That might be a disciplinary. Worth it, though. Nothing in the rules about stabbing. Poor form, though. Ian's got some great knives, but an ice pick would have a certain irony. This is a reference to the General Secretary, Ian McNichol, and to the murder of Leon Trotsky. Would killing your leader with an ice pick or knife not come under bringing the party into disrepute? Not in this case. Reading this, there's about a dozen people in this WhatsApp group, the most senior officials in the Labour Party. They obviously have total confidence in one another that this conversation is not going to be leaked. They're not taking orders from Mr Corbyn, quite the opposite. They obviously hold the party leadership in, in contempt. After a year as leader, Corbyn is forced to stand for a second time following an attempted coup. While the party establishment challenges Corbyn, he inspires hundreds of thousands of new members to join. Staff at party headquarters launch what is known as the validation process. They scour the social media of new members. It's claimed the goal is to weed out those who hold offensive views. The Labour files reveal the methodology used by party staff. They draw up a list of Labour MPs and search for abuse directed at them and only at those MPs. If you look at the name of the MPs, and I've got a list of, of 57, and the very odd thing is, as far as I can see, there's scarcely a single supporter of Jeremy Corbyn on this list. It kind of loads it in a very significant way, but it's only going to pick up those hostile to uh, the right wing of the party, i.e. Corbynite supporters. Can you hear me OK? We've had a bit of a overflow. More than 11,000 members are identified as needing to be investigated. It creates a backlog in the disciplinary unit and diverts staff from tackling anti-Semitism. Factionalism within the Labour Party was so endemic and so pronounced that it actually was disrupting the Labour Party's ability to deal with, for example, anti-Semitism cases. The validation process is run by Sam Matthews, who soon becomes head of the disputes team handling anti-Semitism. Denial is not an option. Prevarication is not an option. Being a bystander who turns their head the other way is not an option. The time for action is now. By the spring of 2018, Corbyn is as frustrated as his critics. The Labour files show that in February that year, Corbyn writes to the party's general secretary Ian McNichol, angry that the disputes team under Sam Matthews is so ineffective in tackling anti-Semitism. It is clear that the current processes are far too slow to meet the volume of disciplinary cases the party has to deal with. In a draft response, McNichol claims the scale of anti-Semitism in the party is exaggerated. Over half of the complaints made relate to non-members and therefore are not a matter for the complaints team. He urges Corbyn to... Remind colleagues in the Shadow Cabinet and the Parliamentary Labour Party that misguided comments attacking the unit undermine the work they do and serve only those in the right-wing press. In April 2018, Corbyn puts close ally Jenny Formby in charge of the party bureaucracy. Formby replaces McNichol as General Secretary at party headquarters, finally giving the leadership authority over the disputes department. Staff brought in by Formby to work on disputes are appalled at what they find. There was no record keeping, so a number of members had been suspended or investigated. However, we couldn't find the evidence for what, what caused the suspension or the investigation. So it was clear to me that cases just hadn't been worked on. So for me to start in 2019 and have first eyes on cases from 2016 was quite absurd. Once Corbyn is in control of the party bureaucracy, the disciplinary process improves. 
This graph shows the number of suspensions, investigations and expulsions from the Labour Party on grounds of anti-Semitism all through the Corbyn era. And this is the moment when Jenny Formby becomes General Secretary of the Labour Party, enabling Jeremy Corbyn to take control of the bureaucracy of how Labour works. After they took control, the number of investigations, suspensions and expulsions went up exponentially. This graph on its own does a great deal to raise deep questions about the dominant media narrative on the Corbyn era. Analysis of the party's internal disciplinary statistics tells the same story. During the two and a half years that McNichol is Corbyn's general secretary, 44 anti-Semitism cases are brought before the party's ruling National Executive Committee. In the two years Jenny Formby is in charge, 379 anti-Semitism cases go before the NEC. The NEC decides whether to suspend or expel members. The key finding, backed up by the evidence, which we can see represented graphically here, is that the key failings of the Labour Party on anti-Semitism took place in the period before April 2018 before Jeremy Corbyn had control of the party bureaucracy. Yet Jeremy Corbyn has taken all the blame and his factional opponents within the party, none at all. BBC Panorama's damning film on Labour's handling of anti-Semitism is the culmination of three years hostile media coverage. I am heartbroken and disgusted that the party that I joined over a decade ago is now institutionally racist. The panorama features interviewees drawn almost entirely from the period when Ian McNichol was General Secretary and Sam Matthews ran the disputes unit. Panorama's interviewees claim that attempts to tackle anti-Semitism were undermined by the Corbyn leadership. Mr Corbyn and his office have repeatedly said that when party members are accused of anti-Semitism, they don't interfere in the disciplinary process. Indeed, the Labour Party said any such suggestion is categorically untrue. But that doesn't seem to be the case. In an email, Mr Corbyn's Director of Communications, Seamus Milne, asked for a review of the disciplinary process into anti-Semitic complaints. There was a risk, he said, of muddling up political disputes with racism. How did you interpret that email from Mr Milne? The, the same way that all staff in Labour's head office did, which is that this was the leader's office requesting to be uh, involved directly in the disciplinary process. Our investigation finds that communications director, Seamus Milne, is specifically asked for his view by Emily Oldno, an executive director who oversees the disputes team. Milne is also referring to a very specific case. James Schneider worked alongside Milne and has the full email that Matthews referred to in the Panorama program. It reads, this member is a Jewish activist, the son of a Holocaust survivor. If we're more than very occasionally using disciplinary action against Jewish members for anti-Semitism, something's going wrong and we're muddling up political disputes with racism. Quite apart from this specific case, I think going forward, we need to review where and how we're drawing the line if we're going to have clear and defensible processes. So, how this is used is just the red bit. So these 10 words, the great irony is that this is totally correct and is borne out as being totally correct because the Labour Party has actually, again and again, disciplined Jewish people disproportionately for anti-Semitism because it has been muddling up political disputes with racism, political disputes within the Jewish community. 
The BBC programme only reflects one side of the divide within the Jewish community. It does not speak to supporters of the pro-Corbyn Jewish Voice for Labour group. Instead, it draws on the experiences of young Jewish party members whose affiliation is not identified. There was a selection of very eloquent interviews, but what the Panorama programme did not withheld from the viewer was the fact that most of these idealistic young people were officials in the anti-Corbyn Jewish labor movement. That doesn't mean, by the way, that what they were saying was untrue. It simply means that if you're going to assess what they're saying, it's relevant, essential even, that uh, Panorama viewers should be told that, and they won't. The interviewees include Ella Rose, who's worked for the Israeli embassy in London and led the Jewish labor movement. Izzy Lenga was JLM's international officer. She tells a remarkable story. I'm Izzy Lenga. I joined the Labour Party in 2015. The anti-Semitic abuse I received was what I was subjected to every single day. Telling me Hitler was right, telling me Hitler did not go far enough. And she came up with this utterly shocking statement, which really emphasised the scale of the, what can one could only describe as the, the, the immorality and the depravity of Corbyn's Labour Party. But is it really true? I mean, we can check this out. In 2015, when Lenga was at university, neo-Nazi posters appear on campus saying, Hitler was right. Lenga is involved in getting them removed and receives online anti-Semitic abuse. If you read this article in the Daily Mail and it's also in subsequent reporting, there's no suggestion in it that the Labour Party is involved at all. All the left, it's a strong suggestion in it. Actually, it comes from the sort of fascist right. It's just so far outside the bounds of possibility. I mean, have you ever been in any room where if someone says Hitler was right, every day, they're saying it every day, and everyone just doesn't do anything, doesn't say anything, doesn't respond, doesn't say, well, I mean, I mean, can you imagine? It does make you wonder if in the summer of 2019, we'd reached a stage where the, you could say almost anything you liked about Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. The BBC produced a documentary bearing directly on the character and the fitness for office of the leader of the Labour Party, the leader of Her Majesty's opposition, in a moment of intense constitutional crisis. Now that's a momentous intervention in British politics. So I do think the BBC have to look really carefully at their record here. The BBC's reporting prompts critical and alarmist coverage in the British press. It helps establish a consensus that Corbyn has failed to tackle anti-Semitism. The more alarmist wing of reporting on this issue it hurts Jewish people because I, the idea that Jewish people were afraid of a Corbyn government is true. But why? It's the fact that we're told it's an existential threat by our own papers. We're presented with this image of hordes of virulent anti-Semites. Now, that frightens people. And you can understand why that frightens people because that is a terrifying image. It's a terrifying vision. It just has nothing to do with the truth whatsoever. And at least some of the people that were propagating it knew it had nothing to do with the truth. In the spring of 2019, Britain's Equalities and Human Rights Commission, or EHRC, announces it is investigating the Labour Party for anti-Semitism. It's in response to a formal complaint from the Jewish Labour Movement and other organisations. 
Like Panorama, the equalities body focuses on the leadership. The Labour files contain a letter from the EHRC to the Labour Party. It lists 14 individuals it wants to investigate. The names include Corbyn and 13 close colleagues and allies. What is gobsmacking is that not one of the people involved in the disciplinary process prior to the arrival of Jenny Formby as General Secretary is being investigated. This is absolutely baffling. We have failed Jewish people, our members, our supporters and the British public. When the EHRC report is published a year later, it makes no reference at all to McNichol, Matthews or any other staff members who'd handled anti-Semitism complaints before April 2018. Instead, it condemns the Corbyn leadership for... 23 instances of political interference. In the complaints process, this, it says, was... Discriminatory and unlawful. The EHRC report accused the leadership of the Labour Party of interfering in, in the disciplinary process. The ironic thing is, if you actually read the EHRC report closely, and you have to read it closely because this is not made explicit at all, many of the interventions that were made by Jeremy Corbyn's office were actually to try to speed up processes or to ask why nothing was being done. And actually, the EHRC's legal logic, if you follow it through, becomes quite bizarre. Time to apologise. Mr Livingston, why are you bring time to apologise? One of the accusations is that by attempting to speed up Ken Livingstone's case, the leader's office was thereby, in the, in the words of the EHRC report, indirectly discriminating against Jewish Labour Party members because the case was being treated differently. So I think people would be surprised to find out that the way that the case was being treated differently was not that Jeremy Corbyn was trying to protect his friend from accusations of anti-Semitism. Actually, supposedly, the discrimination against Jewish members was that in this case, the Leader's Office was intervening to speed up a process. On the one hand, Corbyn is lacerated for uh, tolerating a, a, a culture of anti-Semitism. On the other hand, he's lacerated for interfering to try uh, and deal with the problem. He's damned either way. We're in state, Mark Lodsberg. Soon after Formby, Corbyn's ally, takes over as General Secretary, the disciplinary case against Mark Wadsworth is finally heard by the party. Wadsworth had been accused of anti-Semitism by a Jewish Labour MP. I've been waiting for two years for this. It's been torture, it's been agony. I've been hung out to dry. I was uh, put before a three-day hearing. Didn't stand a chance. I mean, they'd already decided uh, that I was guilty, whatever evidence I put before them. The outcome was that I was expelled, bringing the party into disrepute. They didn't say that I'd been anti-Semitic because they realised that that simply didn't stand up. Mr Corbyn, have you had any doubts? Jeremy Corbyn didn't look after me. He threw me under a bus. They were desperate to get into number 10, to get into number 11. There were many instances where I did feel quite uncomfortable in terms of how far they were pursuing individuals for anti-Semitism. We were instructed to scour through Facebook pages and social media pages of individuals who we were looking for anti-Semitic material for. The word Palestine was included as a search term, which was the thing that alarmed me the most. We would act almost immediately to any inquiries that would come in from the Jewish Chronicle or Jewish News. Um, even if it was, you know, at close of play, we would often get instructed by the directors to just stay behind so we can take action on those, those individuals. The Labour files reveal that anti-Semitism campaigners are scouring social media accounts for evidence to send to Labour headquarters. One has to understand that this was a social media crisis, that it involved people crawling through extraordinary numbers of social media accounts 
to find examples that could be interpreted as anti-Semitism. So what we have here is the anti-Semitism cases logs, which logs every single complaint of anti-Semitism made during the Corbyn years and after the Corbyn years. 23% of all complaints in the Corbyn era involved one single individual complainant. 23%. 12% came from the organization Labour Against Anti-Semitism. Labour Against Anti-Semitism is a collective of party activists. It regularly makes accusations against Jewish party members. But its spokesman, Ewan Phillips, is not Jewish. The Labour files show that Phillips writes to the party's disputes unit using a pseudonym that appears Jewish. David Gordstein. On one occasion, he uses his real name. Thank you, Ewan. He hastily corrects himself. I meant, thank you, David. Labour Against Anti-Semitism does have a Jewish advisor. Whether Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite or not, he just has too many anti-Semitic associations, too many terrorist associations to be able to be trusted in Downing Street. Jonathan Hoffman at one time demonstrated alongside the English Defence League. Now, he's on mainstream TV news. From Jewish Voice for Labour and Jonathan Hoffman, who is a consultant to the Labour Against Anti-Semitism group. Thank you both for joining us. It's absolutely not satisfactory. And the issues with the, between the Jewish community and between Labour and anti-Semitism, which I represent, and Labour Party will go on after today. <laughs> The blog run by Richard Millett becomes the source for a number of stories about Corbyn's alleged anti-Semitism. They include a 2013 incident when Corbyn accused a group of Zionists of lacking a sense of English irony. The Zionists present at the meeting he was describing were Millett, Hoffman and Sharon Clough. I am just dumbstruck. These people consorted with known right-wing extremists, with known racists, with Islamophobes. When they have a story about what they perceive to be anti-Semitism, they're taken seriously and at face value by the mainstream media, who don't seem to conduct any kind of research into their background or their associates. I'm just amazed at the hypocrisy. At Labour headquarters, the pressure over anti-Semitism takes a toll. There was an individual who I had expelled out of the Labour Party for anti-Semitism, and she was an elderly lady. And she passed away soon after her expulsion, and people were blaming the party's expulsion, leading to her death, as she had a stroke which led to her death. We had a team meeting, and in the meeting, a senior officer had laughed and said, look, we're anti-Semite killers now. And the whole room broke out in laughter. At that stage, I just broke down because, you know, I'd, I just didn't know how to deal with something so horrendous. I blamed myself is something that deeply, deeply impacted me, I think. You Nazi You Nazi scum. You should burn in the gas oven, you dirty Police discovered this answer phone threat has been left by a Jewish man. Jewish supporters of Jeremy Corbyn find themselves in an increasingly hostile environment. I have had phone calls. I had some phone calls from somebody who said he was outside my door and he knew, you know, he knew my home and he knew where I lived and he was going to put me in a wheelchair and then that sort of thing, yeah. I met what to me was utterly cruel nastiness from the local Labour Party. 
And what was so cool was that I'd been a member of the Labour Party since I was a young socialist at 15 or something. And I used to love the Labour Party. I had friends here. People turned against me, people I knew. People who my children babysat for their children. They say, you, you know, don't go, don't cross over and talk to Jenny Manson. It's Jenny Manson, you know, that kind of thing. It's been horrible. Your opinion has been all over the media. This is my turn to have no, our opinion. I'm standing here and I'm entitled to express my view. No. Let her have an interview. Use force. I'm Use not force. using force. No. I'm trying to stop you disrupting an interview no. so that everyone I'm can have their voice heard. The this is what happens when you try to raise a different view. I'm ashamed of you and all those that... Shame on you! 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 While pro-Corbyn Jews find themselves shouted down, Palestinian voices are silenced almost entirely. The crisis in the Labour Party in 2018 coincides with the Great March of Return in the Gaza Strip. A group of unarmed people marched to the barrier that Israel had erected between Gaza and the rest of the country, and uh, demanding uh, that they should return to their homes and lands. The Israelis responded with fire. In eight months, over 150 Palestinians are killed. It was inspiring in one way to see the strength and resilience of the Palestinian people. But at the same time, it was absolutely devastating. They shot a journalist, Yasser Maturja, a member with a press vest on. They shot a, a nurse with her hands up. I mean, these were war crimes being committed. But then at the same time, everything in the Labour Party was, it was a different world. It wasn't talked about. It wasn't um, put at the forefront. And they, they were, the, the headlines were on anti-Semitism. And so I feel like a lot of people, when it came to Palestine, felt like they had to walk on eggshells in order to get the terminology exactly right. People become more and more fearful of speaking up for the Palestinian people uh, because it's easier not to. Enthusiastic campaigners increasingly focus their efforts on compelling the Labour Party to adopt a new definition of anti-Semitism. I'd be very clear that only the full adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism is good enough. No ifs, no buts, no caveats. The NEC has got to adopt the internationally agreed code, lock, stock and barrel. Palestinians opposed the new definition. The IHRA definition was eagerly taken up by Western governments uh, and, and Western institutions, um, and it was blatantly, blatantly pro-Israeli and anti, and therefore anti-Palestinian. The controversy around the definition concerns the examples that accompany it. These are the 11 illustrative examples of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Seven of them, these in red, refer to Israel. It conflates criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. The seventh one, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, for instance, by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor, is particularly problematic because by acknowledging the right to self-determination of the Jewish people, you are by definition removing the right of self-determination from the Palestinian people. 
not only must we unanimously agree this definition of anti-Semitism, we must take the proper procedures in line to discipline those who undermine them. The IHRA definition of anti-Semitism is deeply flawed. Uh, so the overall impression given by the document is that anti-Semitism includes criticism of Israel or criticism of Zionism. It has embedded this um, confused definition of anti-Semitism into, into the public consciousness. There was a lot of attempts to push back. Truthfully, I think at that time period, there was very minimum success in pushing the Palestinian narrative into the media around this issue. To me, what I remember is there basically being near to none. Labour's ruling National Executive Committee is gathering to discuss whether to adopt the IHRA definition. Outside are familiar pro-Israel activists. They include Sharon Claff, who sympathises with the racist English Defence League. She has asked whether anti-Semitism is being weaponized to attack Corbyn. That in itself is an anti-Semitic trope, to say that a group of people would use something as serious as race hate to try and undermine a politician. Inside, the NEC passes the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, including the examples that link anti-Semitism to criticism of Israel. We adopted the IHRA because it was politically impossible to hold up why you, you know, why you wouldn't. Day after day on the media, there are Jewish voices who want the IHRA definition. The counter pressure from Palestinian voices in the media and so on was absent. I wasn't surprised that it passed. They created a climate where I think many people thought that the only way the attacks would stop is if this definition was passed. But I wish, I just wish that Jeremy Corbyn had stood up for what he truly believed in at that time. Our exit poll is suggesting that there will be a conservative majority the Labour Party suffers one of its worst electoral defeats. Jeremy Corbyn is replaced as Labour leader by Sir Keir Starmer. It is the honour and the privilege of my life to be elected as leader of the Labour Party. The new leader has a very different view of the relationship between Israel and the Palestinians. Amnesty International recently released a report where they accused Israel of being an apartheid state. Yeah. That was embraced and supported by many members of your party, particularly on the, on the left. Um, do you agree with them? No. Um, I've been very clear about that. Um, and that is not the Labour Party um, position. Staff in the party's disputes department feel a change. I believe the criteria for anti-Semitism changed quite dramatically within Keir's leadership. It was quite clear that anti-Semitism was going to be used as a tool under the new leadership to essentially strike out as many left-wing members as possible. Many Jews are among those targeted by the new leadership. At least 56 Jewish people that we know of have at some point during this completely insane period in Labour Party history been either investigated, suspended or actually expelled from the party for something to do with anti-Semitism. Jewish members of the Labour Party, we've calculated, are 6.3 times more likely to be investigated by the Labour Party for allegations of anti-Semitism than non-Jews in the Labour Party. People have written about the false allegation of anti-Semitism. People have written about their experience of, um, uh, of their uh, increasing anger with Israel and Palestine. We call that anti-Semites. All, we're all old. Our parents were Holocaust victims, effectively. My mother escaped a pogrom. How dare they tell us they're anti-Semitic? And how dare they challenge us that we don't know what anti-Semitism is? 
Starmer settles a court case with the journalist who presented the BBC Panorama programme and with former Labour Party staff who gave interviews. The Corbyn leadership had described them as disaffected former officials with personal and political axes to grind. We are pleased that our reputations have been restored, although it will take time to repair the damage caused by their unfounded attacks. The former staff receiving damages include Ben Westerman, the investigator who told the inaccurate story about Rika Bird, and Sam Matthews, who gave the arguably misleading description of the email by Corbyn's communications director. The Labour files include a document that reveals the party settled against the advice of its own lawyers. We have the legal advice given by the lawyers of the Labour Party. Now, I'm used to seeing legal advice in these circumstances. Normally it's hedged round with sort of caution coming from a lawyer. This is the most unambiguous legal, legal advice I've ever seen. The legal advice read, In my opinion, the party is likely to successfully defend these claims. The defamatory meaning identified by the claimants can be shown to be fundamentally flawed. The advice does not suggest that the party's allegations were true. However, it clearly states that a range of other strong legal defences were available and that most of the claims could be defeated on those grounds. The party's lawyers are also concerned that issues of principle arise in the case of the BBC journalist who is demanding more than $150,000. The legal advice read, For a reporter who has fronted a highly critical, indeed condemnatory documentary about a political party to receive a six-figure sum in damages would I think have an exceptionally chilling and disproportionate effect on free speech. Starmer ignores the lawyers and pays hundreds of thousands of dollars in damages. So what was the reason that Mr Starmer settled? I think he... He's defining himself against Mr. Corbyn. He wants to renounce Corbyn and all his works. And part of that renunciation is to accept that the case from the BBC whistleblowers was valid and, and, and give in to it. The leaders of Jewish groups that support Israel hold a Zoom call with the Labour Party spokesman on communities and local government, Steve Reed. The plan is to discuss anti-Semitism. But the conversation quickly turns to BDS, the campaign to boycott Israeli goods and divest from the country in order to pressure Israel to end its occupation of Palestinian land. Israel is deeply concerned about BDS, and the British Conservative Party has agreed to introduce legislation making it illegal for public bodies to boycott Israel. The Labour files contain the minutes of the meeting. Amanda Bowman is vice president of the influential board of deputies of British Jews. According to the minutes, she... introduced the topic of BDS legislation. She understands that while Labour might hesitate to support Tories on anti-BDS legislation, she advises that Labour would be unwise to do anything to oppose this. Bowman went on. The Board of Deputies are keen to counter suppositions from Labour MPs that because they're nominally committed to combating anti-Semitism, that it gives them carte blanche to say what they like about Israel. Reid assured her he would never accept attempts to exceptionalise and delegitimize Israel. Reading that document and seeing it like laid out quite clearly, this mix-up of anti-Semitism, opposing racism towards the Jewish community, and opposing BDS policy in in one in one meeting is quite shocking to see. BDS for Palestinians is a way of pressuring Israel to comply with international law, to end the illegal occupation of Palestine and to adhere and give Palestinians equal rights. It shows basically it is not enough to 
combat anti-Semitism. You have to counter any attempts to show solidarity and effective solidarity with the Palestinian people. After six years of rigorous investigations, the Labour Party found sufficient evidence to open anti-Semitism-related investigations into less than half of 1% of its membership. That figure includes many of the interviewees in this film. They have created an incredibly hostile environment for anybody, including any Jew, who is in any way critical of Israel. To be accused of racism, to be accused of anti-Semitism, is frankly terrifying. And most important of all, it has silenced Palestinians, the victims of Israeli apartheid, the victims of occupation, the victims of oppression. And it has silenced those who wish to support them. I was invited to speak to the constituency uh, about Palestine. And I was very glad to do it. Now that constituent, Nor Hackney North, is known to be a left-wing, uh, pro generally pro-Palestinian constituency. So I felt really I was among friends. I remember saying something like, there are two Palestines now. There's Palestine over there, which is the, obviously the conflict with Israel, occupied territories, etc., and the Palestine over here, which is the one where we are being silenced, where this IHRA definition is being used. That's what I wanted to talk about. Well, I didn't get a chance. The chairperson of the meeting stopped me, just like that, stopped me dead and said, no, we can't go on with this. We can't go on with this. Thank you very much. And I was cut off, just like that. It's, I can't describe the way I felt. It was like a slap in the face. It was like being elbowed out physically of a meeting, a door opening and being thrown out into the corridor. It, it felt just like that. There are still those who think there's no problem with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, that it's all exaggerated or a factional attack, then frankly, you are part of the problem too. And you should be nowhere near the Labour Party either.
in episode three of The Labour Files, how Keir Starmer allowed a culture of racism to develop in the Labour Party. There's a point at which the people involved in this have stopped regarding people of African heritage as human. They really don't like people who are black or brown and on the left. 